So welcome everyone to Raising Recycling Awareness Through Education. Thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Juliana Fanous and I'm a project coordinator for the Green Municipal Fund at the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Today's webinar is the third in a five-part Thinking Big webinar series on plastic waste management solutions for Canadian municipalities. Let's start with a quick overview of what the Green Municipal Fund is. So the Federation of Canadian Municipalities has been the national voice of municipal governments since 1901, with diverse programs and services designed to support municipalities. One of these programs is the Green Municipal Fund, which was established in 2000 after an endowment by the Government of Canada. The fund has a double mission to support municipal initiatives and sustainable development through funding, but also to share knowledge and lessons through online resources and tools, trainings, network opportunities, and peer learning uh, activities. The Green Municipal Fund is available for plans, studies, pilot projects, and capital projects across uh, the five sectors that you see on the screen. So transportation, water performance, energy performance, waste reduction, and brownfields. This funding is available to all municipal governments and their partners in eligible projects. Since its inception, the fund has funded more than 1,400 initiatives in over 500 communities across Canada. If you want to know more about these initiatives, our approved projects database is a wealth of resources on our funded projects, including case studies, reports, contact information, and so on. I would really encourage you to take um, a link at that we're going to send in the chat box. We are having a few technical difficulties, so you might be getting that link throughout um, some of the presentation, so please um, keep updated with that. I also encourage you to sign up for our weekly newsletter, uh, FCM Connect, to get all the latest updates on what we have to offer. Please note that if you do uh, sign up with FCM Connect, you will be receiving a notification of when these webinars will be available uh, as a recording on our FCM YouTube channel. And I invite you to join us again next week on March 7th as we take a closer look at how municipalities have collaborated and partnered with their local waste sorting centers. So next week we're going to have uh, St. John's and Scotia Re Recycling uh, showcase their partnership. We're also hosting another webinar that might be interest to some of you or your colleagues. So the FCM and Natural Resources Canada are running a joint webinar on March 6th to introduce municipalities to an energy management tool called RETScreen. So we will be sharing a registration link uh, in the web for that as well. I believe um, some of our tech support is coming back, so you'll be getting that momentarily. Another thing to note is the Urban Sustainability Directors Network recently commissioned a sustainable consumption toolkit to help municipalities advance to shift consumption patterns to meet energy and waste reduction climate and climate change goals as well. So it really speaks to a US audience, but many of these findings are still relevant for us here in Canada. And the cities of Toronto and Vancouver were members of the working group. So if you're interested, um, you'll be getting a link shortly again in your chat box. So lots of links to keep up for. So taking a look at who is attending this webinar with us today, you can see on the map though we really have a wide range of people that are listening from all across the country. Uh, we even have people in every single province and territory this week, so that's really great to see um, everyone's involvement. And to give you a quick idea of the greenhouse gas emissions that we save by having these presentations online, rather than having all of you guys come and fly to Ottawa, based on the registration numbers, we estimated that we avoided over 95,000 kilograms of carbon dioxide emissions, as well as approximately 1,000 kilograms of waste that you might have generated on your flights or other modes of transport over. So a big thank you to all of you for your environmental con contribution. And we can obviously see the great benefits of technologies in this case. We also have quite a diversity of people with a wide range of backgrounds and experience on the line with us today. Some of you are working in solid waste management and diversion, uh, education, communication, sustainability, among a lot of other fields. We also have a nice crowd of people here 
for general interest. So it's really, I'm really happy to see so many curious minds uh, ready to learn about the initiatives that uh, have gone on in the country today. We had almost 300 people on the line last week and the interest is just as strong this week. For those that weren't able to join the last couple of weeks, these webinars are intended to demonstrate and showcase the many ways in which plastic waste is being addressed and to hone in on the specific actions and approaches that can be delivered by municipalities in Canada. As we saw in the past webinars, there are significant efforts both globally and nationally to stem the flow of plastics leaking out of the economy and into the environment. For these three remaining webinars, we will particularly focus on municipality specific responses in addressing challenges relating to plastic waste management in Canada. Today in particular, we'll shed light on the education, communication and engagement initiatives of municipalities to mobilize action in their own communities, ultimately resulting in reduced contamination rates and improving the overall quality of the materials that are being processed. And to help us navigate this conversation, we are joined today by speakers from two municipalities. We have with us Michael Di Pasquale from the city of Markham and Andrew Duffield from the city of Beaconsfield. So thank you so much both for joining us on the line today. I'm gonna to turn the floor over to you momentarily, but first there's a few last housekeeping items. An update, our, our speakers will present for approximately half of the webinar time, so it leaves about 20 minutes or so for questions. Please feel free to send your questions through the chat function and we're gonna respond to them once the presentations are complete. We're gonna aim to move through as many questions as possible during our time. And this is also just to highlight that the session is indeed being recorded and it will be available on the FCM YouTube channel in the coming weeks. So we're gonna start off with our presentation um, by Michael Di Pasquale. So Michael has worked with the city of Markham in municipal solid waste management for the past six years, dealing primarily with collection contract management and diversion program development. He is the project manager for several diversion initiatives, including improved sorting system development and expansion of organic collection services to multi-residential buildings, as well as the continued improvement and expansion of Markham's textile recycling program, an initiative that was partially funded by the FCM. And with that, it is my pleasure to hand things over to you, Michael. I've just handed you control of the ball, so you should be able to move through your slides now. Well, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Juliana, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry if I sound uh, a bit muffled. I'm just getting over a cold, but uh, as Juliana mentioned, I'm uh, Michael Di Pasquale, and for the past uh, several years, I've been working with Markham's Environmental Services Department uh, on both waste operations and on the project development side. It, Markham has been recognized as a, as a very progressive community with, uh, within the realm of municipal waste management. And uh, that progressive stance has translated down into curbside programs that uh, we're very proud of, like, like clear bags for garbage and uh, some forward-thinking initiatives uh, like our city-branded textile program. I'm gonna, I'll circle back to those uh, a little later on. just want to see if I could jump ahead here. Okay, perfect. Uh, but in regards to plastics management and uh, other waste diversion opportunities, uh, Markham has strived to, to hold its own staff to the same high standards that we expect of uh, our residents. And, and that starts with, with leading by example and, and trying to achieve zero waste at our civic facilities, which I'll touch on in the, in the next set of slides. Uh, we've also worked diligently to create a level playing field for all residential stakeholders, whether you live in a curbside home or you live in a multi-residential building. And much of this is realized through our development approval process. And I've got, uh, I've got some slides that focus on that later on. And lastly, we, we've worked very closely with, uh, with our local school boards to ensure that Markham's waste management programs are, are mirrored in the city's elementary schools. So the, the younger generation is, is exposed to the idea of, of think before you throw, both at home uh, and in school. So back, back to the idea of uh, leading by example, and I had mentioned that Markham is doing its part to achieve zero waste at our civic facilities, like in our offices, our rec centers, uh, in our libraries. And back in, in 2009, Markham established a corporate zero waste policy, and it, it focuses specifically on sustainable purchasing practices for materials and for services that are used within the organization. And that specifically looks at banning the procurement of 
common single-use plastics that you might see at committee meetings and in public events like your, your plastic straws, your stir sticks, your cups, cutlery, styrofoam, so on. However, at our at our civic facilities, it wasn't just it wasn't just a matter of creating and enforcing a policy. It was we needed to make some serious changes to the the systems that existed in our buildings, and we had open access to waste rooms and containers, and we had personal garbage cans at every desk. We, we had a real mixture across uh, all facilities of disposal bins. Essentially, there was zero standardization and and zero accountability. So, so beyond the policy, there was really a need to buy new containers and, and to make adjustments to, to how we manage waste uh, in our own buildings and educate our staff so, so we could really walk the talk effectively. And, and part of that commitment from, from Markham's council uh, was dedicated funding for, for all those requirements, the new infrastructure and, uh, and new promotional tools. Uh, we had workstation kits that were put together for, for all full-time staff members that included uh, under the desk blue bins and, and other materials that you can see on the slide. Uh, all uh, sustainably sourced, and we committed to we committed to doing dozens of, of lunch and learns, and designed posters and printouts and, and sent out e-blasts, all pushing this this message of of zero waste. And we can and we still do today. We go through we go through each building about twice a year and uh, and confiscate personal garbage cans, which I could I could say from personal experience is is a fun way to to meet new people and meet your fellow staff mates. And we also we worked with uh, with a local company to design um, these two stream bins, which are, were built for built from recycled plastic lumber, uh, and they were we had them appropriately color coordinated to match our program's colors. And the core concept of, of standardizing the waste stations across Markham facilities was to ensure that that both staff and the public would always have the same experience when when throwing something away. All three streams would be available to them along with with posters featuring icons or images to help influence that decision. And, uh, and lastly, we set up uh, ancillary diversion programs to uh, at all the, the major corporations, uh, major centers, and we have you know, battery, light bulb, plastic bag, styrofoam, uh, and e-waste at the majority of our facilities. Uh, and I think it's important to note that th this is what our, our council wanted, and they were fine with, with some of the price tags that came along um, with these diversion opportunities. And I, I think it is important to recognize that because the reality is diversion isn't cheap. It's one of the major barriers that we face in our industry every day. Uh, so we have, we have a collection contract specifically for collecting these items with a local hauler. Uh, and Markham made the decision to invest in these opportunities and they continue today. Just for example, we, we collected over 10,000 pounds of batteries from our facilities alone last year. So it's, it's, they're obviously initiatives that are still working. Now, I, uh, I mentioned before our zero waste policy. It was sort of our, our pseudo step one before the, the on the ground implementation uh, in our buildings. And that policy governs uh, what the corporation can and cannot purchase. Um, but that also extends to the, to the food vendors who win contracts for space in our buildings. Uh, we have four or five vendors in our, in our civic facilities, um, one in our civic center and the, the others are in our community centers. And part of the bid document for those RFPs that go out is the acknowledgement that the, the vendor contracted by the city uh, cannot bring in single-use plastics uh, and in styrofoam. So the, the reality is that uh, vendors actually conform with the policy probably more effectively. Uh, it's our staff that, that often we find make the mistakes and, and and that kind of brings us full circle to, to where we are now. We have, we have a corporate zero waste policy and, and the right infrastructure in place, but, but things by no means are perfect. Environmental policy enforcement is, is really hard, and we, we struggle to sometimes elevate its importance to that, that echelon of you know, where the purchasing policies and your uniform policies are, the ones that, that people actually care about. So that's, uh, that's where we are with, with our corporate zero waste initiative. It's in place, and now we're looking for ways to uh, make it a priority in every commission uh, and in everyone's workspace, and that's, that's going to be our, our next major challenge. So that kind of, uh, let me go back a slide here. Okay. So that kind of gives you a sense of the, the efforts that we've made uh, internally as an organization to, to manage our purchasing habits and, and educate the users of our, our internal waste systems. Uh, in terms of our public programs, though, uh, many of our, our contemporary initiatives were actually born out of uh, this report 
that I'm showing on the screen from 2012, uh, our roadmap to 80% diversion, which, uh, which lists 10 diversion programs that were picked by, by council to achieve this goal. And, uh, and here you can see them listed. We were, we, we were able to launch uh, all of them with the exception of our retail bag policy and the uh, carpet diversion program. Uh, so each of these programs has allowed us to achieve a curbside diversion rate of, of 81% based on our, our 2018 collection data. And I, I just want to qualify that number by clarifying 81% doesn't include our contamination rates and residual figures. We're, we're part of a two-tier municipal waste management system where our regional authority, York Region, handles our material processing. So the number we get from our hauler is the number that we report out on, and, and we're proud of that figure because uh, it indicates a high degree of participation in our, in our curbside programs. Uh, and we've helped foster high participation by leveraging the tools and powers municipalities have at their disposal, like bylaws, like development agreements. And number one uh, on this list here, you can see, is, is our mandatory source separation bylaw. And that, uh, that bylaw extends from curbside to, to multi-res uh, and even to the ICNI sector where we actually require all new commercial development to provide evidence of recycling programs to store their waste internally. And uh, then we hold letters of credit to ensure that these requirements are being met by owners and by tenants. And we, we include all of this in the, in the development agreement signed uh, between the developer and the city. Uh, and even when IC and I sites actually submit applications for redevelopment, whether you know they're building an addition or maybe just expanding their parking lot, that gives us a chance. We jump in and we, we include our conditions in those amended site plan agreements, and we take new security. And it, it really is—it's hard for municipalities to uh, insert themselves in the world of, of IC and I waste management. But but tools like a, like a development process sign-off or you know conditions in site plan agreements can really really go a long way. Uh, in, ref in reference to, to multi-res, I mentioned one of uh, Markham's core principles previously was to ensure that we offered <clears throat> the, the same opportunities to residents in apartment and condos uh, as those at the curb. And that, that all starts with offering the same levels of service to buildings that curbside homes receive. And uh, due to a council resolution back in, in the early 2000s and a subsequent bylaw, uh, we've been able to ensure that all new multi-residential developments our, our service under the public collection contract and are designed to support three stream source separation required uh, that's required by our mandatory separation bylaw. So we're now we're planning on piloting the, the use of three separate shoots as a mandatory design requirement um, versus uh, three stream sorters. And that, that ultimately may change how we approach our development approvals process in, in the future. Um, what do we got here? Oh, clear bags. Clear bags I mentioned before. Uh, this was second on our roadmap to 80% uh, diversion. Uh, we, we promoted using print and online mediums. We put uh, decals on, uh, on the collection vehicles you can see in this image. Uh, and we actually, we stickered everyone's household green bin with, uh, with a gold star for a month, every time that they, they set out correctly in conformance with the program. And we, you know, people love that, actually. They, they still tell us today that they have those stickers on their bins, and this was all done back in, in 2011. So... The, the Coles notes of this program's success, we, we launched about eight years ago, like I said, 2011. Uh, at that time, we had about uh, 80,000 households. Uh, we were generating 25,000 tons of garbage annually. Uh, and now, in 2018, we have close to 90,000 homes. And, uh, and last year, we collected just over 15,000 tons of garbage. So organic and, and recycling tonnage have both jumped up. Uh, and we shed about 10,000 tons of garbage in that uh, eight year span. So it's definitely a program that has made a significant impact uh, on our diversion. And, and it complements the, the initiatives that we run out of our, our municipal recycling depots and the bans that we've implemented on e-waste and batteries in, in the garbage stream. And uh, we have four community recycling depots that collect polystyrene and plastic bags because we, we don't accept them in our blue bin, but we also take the light bulbs and tires and other materials at the depots and we're looking at the possibility of banning polystyrene from the garbage stream in the near future because of our ability to enforce bans with the clear bag. Uh, and because we have this outlet for people to properly recycle polystyrene at the depots. Uh, and last year we had, we had nearly 200,000 visitors to these sites uh, and we, re we actually recycled over 30 tons of, of polystyrene. And on uh, our e-waste recycling events, uh, we were able to capture about 
60 tons uh, on an annual basis. And so the, these public drop-off events are run over the summer months using our depot space and the parking lots of our community centers uh, and provide our residents with, uh, with an opportunity to, to drop off the electronics that we won't collect at the curb. Uh, public space recycling, I'm just going to touch on our super mailbox program. We've deployed uh, over 2,000 bins to, to mitigate the, the dumping of, of junk mail. I don't know what drives people to stuff their junk mail in between mailboxes or just dump it all on the ground. I've seen it all, but um, this program has helped us tremendously in cutting back on, on windblown litter. And uh, back, to your, back to the beginning uh, of the presentation, I had mentioned that we've We've been working to replicate our waste management programs in, uh, in Markham's elementary schools. Um, right now, we have 70 schools that are participating in our, our zero waste program, and that outfits each, uh, each classroom with uh, organic collection, um, and we have waste stations that, that are set up for each classroom, and education sessions ranging from assemblies all the way down to just simple classroom sessions themselves. And we also put the onus on, uh, on the buildings themselves to purchase sustainably, with, just as we do within, uh, within our own corporation. So I think I'm getting a little, uh, little tight on time here, so I'm gonna jump ahead. I mentioned, uh, I mentioned polystyrene. The polystyrene that we collect at our depots, we, we actually run it through uh, our own densifier uh, so that we're able to, to market the material effectively. And uh, okay, so I, did, I wanted to touch on, on textiles because part of the development of this program, as Juliana mentioned, was actually um, funded by, by FCM, so I got to give them kudos. Uh, we currently have 150 city branded textile donation bins on, uh, on public and private space. Uh, we partner specifically with, with registered charities who, who use the revenue generated from the, the sale of their yield to support their own community programs. And, uh, and here, here are some examples of, of the outreach that we've used. These are mobile signs and, and we actually use them as, as printed online mediums as well. Uh, we launched the, the program in the fall of, of 2016, and since then, we've collected over 14 million pounds of textiles, which is, is more than I think we ever imagined that we would collect, and it's, it's all because of, uh, of Markham residents and their incredible willingness to participate. So this is, this is just a summary of our, our 2017 performance uh, issued by York Region. You can see Markham down in the middle of the table. Uh, the big number is, there is, is, is 64. That's 64 kilograms per, per capita of uh, garbage generated, which uh, we anticipate will be lower when we get the, the 2018 data uh, issued by the region. And here's, uh, and here's just a quick breakdown of that 81% at the curb. Uh, again, like I mentioned, it's, uh, it's based on tons collected. Uh, and this is, this is from last year, from 2018. So we're, we're working, in terms of next steps, we're working on, uh, on our new diversion roadmap. And these are, these are the priorities, the, the big one being a formal plastic strategy. Uh, and we'd, we'd love to hear what other municipalities are, are planning in regards to, to single-use plastics. Uh, we think there needs to be you know, substantial symmetries across uh, all jurisdictions in order to truly implement something that's going to be effective. So if you would like to connect with me after about that, I'd be happy to chat more. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, that's it. I, I guess a big thank you to, to FCM for the invitation to present, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing what Andrew has put together. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Michael. That was a fantastic overview of Markham's journey to zero waste. So we're really looking forward to going through the many questions we've received after our next presentation uh, by Andrew Duffield from the city of Beaconsfield. So uh, Andrew Duffield is a civil engineer with a master's in environmental engineering on soil remediation. He has worked as a municipal engineer and manager for over 20 years. As director of public works for the city of Beaconsfield, he's recognized for the implementation of the city's waste reduction strategy. Andrew Duffield is now the director of sustainable development, a commitment of the city to develop various projects associated with the fight against climate change and to promote environmental responsible development. So it's now my pleasure to introduce to you, Andrew. So it's over to you. You should have control of the ball now. Thank you, Juliana. And thank you also, Michael, for a very interesting perspective for Markham. Uh, so going forward, uh, Beaconsfield's context is quite different from Markham's, uh, a much smaller community. 
uh, where we're not uh, directly responsible for the treatment or the sorting of uh, materials that are collected. And so we've had to implement an approach where uh, we aim at the behavior change uh, with our, our population. So um, I'll have to go back one moment. Uh, a view of, of Beaconsfield. Uh, we're on the island of Montreal. Uh, once again, the agglomeration of Montreal is responsible for the treatment of the materials that are brought to the various uh, centers. And another important feature, uh, we're mostly uh, single family uh, units. We don't have uh, uh, industries and few commercial establishments. So uh, in 2013, our reference point, uh, we were producing uh, the second highest amount per capita on the island of Montreal, so we clearly needed to do something. So we started by looking at what's in our garbage bin. It was uh, more than half was composed of uh, green residue and organic matter that could be composted uh, in, in domestic composting programs. Thankfully, in Beaconsfield, we do have backyards where that is possible. And it's only 6% uh, within the, the bin was as recyclable material. That said, um, that 6% is on a weight basis and the high water content of the green residue and uh, domestic compost material uh, tends to skew that comparison. We opted for a smart collection as a means to uh, influence change. Um, it aimed first at uh, the garbage, um, where uh, this initiative would encourage, we would hope, that the other uh, services will be used to a much greater degree. What is a smart collection? Uh, I'm sure some of you have seen this before, but I'll take over very briefly. Uh, we supply a bin to each of our residents, uh, their choice of size, each equipped with an RFID tag. A reader on the truck allows us to measure when a given bin is picked up at a, at a certain address. And the onboard um, screen allows the contractors to uh, identify why they couldn't pick up a, a given bin on, on a given day. And that's put into a report that we can uh, assess uh, in real time. Here's an example of some of the information that's available to us. Uh, the green points indicate where a bin uh, pickup was took place, red where there was an issue with that pickup, and gray where no pickup uh, took place. Uh, the anomaly reports uh, that are produced uh, in real time allow us to identify what the issues are, uh, when the truck went by, what the GPS location was, and even uh, allows us to take uh, pictures to illustrate uh, what the issue is. Here's some examples of some of the photos. Um, the, when we implemented in 2016 our, our garbage collection program, only the bin equipped with the RFID tag issued by the city would be picked up. So any garbage next to that bin is not collected. Uh, this is an example where a bin was not accessible for the automated uh, collection. Uh, another example where a non-conforming garbage bin was put out for, for pickup. So that uh, allows us to identify why that bit of garbage wasn't collected. And this is simply a, a view of the hopper within the truck to ensure that any items that really shouldn't be there, such as a propane tank, uh, don't uh, get processed. What does this mean from an implementation standpoint for the, uh, the administration? Clearly, we need to assign the bins, each equipped with an RFID tag. Uh, crucially uh, for this, uh, residents have a choice of three different sizes. Uh, then uh, the system allows us to monitor the, the garbage collection in, in real time, which allows us to intervene uh, with our residents the day of the collection. Uh, and also to uh, ensure that uh, any issues uh, from the contractor side are addressed uh, the, 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 uh, in that day, so we don't have to come back the, the, the following day. It greatly reduces our um, uh, level of frustration and improves service to our residents. Uh, another crucial element, if our residents are going to make an effort to make use of all the other services other than garbage, so they put as little as possible into their garbage bin, then uh, 
that effort means that they're putting out their bins less frequently. If they make this effort, we wanted a um, remuneration structure for the contractor so that uh, the efforts of our residents are rewarded in the form of savings that we can then ultimately pass on to our residents. So the contractor is paid in part due to the number of pickups uh, on a given uh, garbage day. And finally, we invoice the residents uh, uh, using a, a link between uh, the smart collection system and our tax roll account. And the incentive tariff that I'll show you later is based both on bin size and the number of times the bins are put out in a given year. As far as the resident is concerned, uh, in, individual choice was uh, key to um, our approach with our residents and to explain the merits of this approach. Um, they had a choice. We intentionally, we had a discussion whether we should be providing only one bin size, but we said uh, from, from the standpoint of choice, we gave uh, three different bin sizes um, uh, as an option for, for residents depending on their individual needs. Uh, we also, um, via the incentive tariff, uh, made it clear that it's up to you when to put out the bin. Um, you'll pay for it when you do put it out, but uh, it's entirely up to you. There's no judgment in, in, in terms of the bin size or how often you put it out, but it's, it's up to you um, uh, when you put it out and there will be a cost associated with that. Uh, ultimately, the message is we want residents to choose the right collection for whatever they produce or they, they consume um, with the ultimate goal to put as little as possible ultimately into the, the garbage bin itself. This also ensures that materials that do have the potential for recovery uh, end up in a uh, facility that allows for those materials to be reused in a post-consumer um, scenario. And finally, uh, the resident uh, determines their cost for the service based on their efforts to uh, divert their, their waste, but also based on their individual needs. So uh, it's a more equitable way of um, invoicing our, our residents who are already paying for, for instance, um, their water consumption based on their, their, their true uh, use of the, the system. An example of the tariff for 2016, there's a, both a fixed element, which covers all the waste collection services, and 12 pickups, or the equivalent of once per month for the garbage. And then for each additional pickup beyond the 12 pickups for garbage alone, there is a different fee based on size. Uh, what does this mean in terms of the final cost to the resident? Uh, we uh, structure the, the tariff so that if someone picks the standard 240 liter size and puts out their bin once every two weeks during the coldest four months, then that the cost uh, to the resident would be um, essentially the same as the fixed cost that were charged to all residents irrespective of use of the service in 2015. What does this mean in terms of performance in our first year of implementation? Um, the, we have the amount of garbage sent to landfill per capita uh, based uh, compared to our benchmark of 2013. That was the lowest in the agglomeration of Montreal. So we went from in 2013, the second highest to the lowest in 2016. Uh, for recycling, um, our recovery rate was 78% versus the Quebec policy for waste management of 70%. Uh, for organic matter, uh, we managed to divert uh, or recover 66% of organic matter compared to the target of 60% for the Quebec policy. And finally, the global recovery rate uh, was 69% compared to the Green Municipal Fund grant um, uh, targets set for subsidies of 60%. Based on these positive um, results with respect to garbage, we then looked at how we can do better for recycling. And so we launched a pilot project subsidized by the FCM, as well as Eco Entreprise Quebec, in, um, uh, who are responsible for uh, managing and promoting recycling services in, uh, in the province of Quebec. The four objectives of the, the pilot were to monitor this, the bin presentation or set out rate of the bins, um, monitor during different operations of the collection, GHG emissions. We also looked at the filling level of the blue bins and ultimately the contamination uh, within the blue bins. 
three pilot project uh, groups were looked at, each with roughly 250 participants. The advised group within Be Concealed were informed of those four objectives of the uh, of the pilot project, and they were given specific uh, targeted information about how to ensure their they may they keep their contamination rates low, and also. Um, to only put out their blue bin when full. The aware groups were also uh, BKC residents, but they were not advised of the uh, pilot project. And our benchmark was in a, an adjacent city who uh, were not uh, subject to a smart collection for garbage. Result number one, uh, for the advised group, they put out their bin 6% uh, less than the aware group. Um, this is uh, statistically significant, but there's still room for, um, um, for, for improvement. Between the biggest hill residents and the benchmark in an adjacent city, there was no um, significant difference between the two, which, seem, which indicates that the smart collection of garbage did not have an impact on our recycling uh, bin presentation rate. Result number two, um, the act of stopping the truck, deploying the arm to pick up the bin and then taking off again uh, versus um, simply driving through all the, the, the streets uh, did have a measurable impact in, in terms of the amount of fuel consumed and ultimately the, the amount of GHG uh, produced. And so for the advised group where the, the bin presentation rate was 6% less, um, we observed a reduction in fuel consumption of some 10%. Um, so where residents really do put out their blue bin only when full, that will have a positive effect in terms of the amount of greenhouse gas produced. We also looked at the bin filling uh, levels. And so we looked at this in quarter fractions. Uh, for the advised group, um, over the course of the, the study, they managed to put out their bins um, uh, increasingly uh, more full, and that was also observed in, in the AWARE group. Uh, but there was a noticeable difference uh, insofar as 74% of the bins for the advised group were put out more than half full, whereas for the AWARE group, even though they saw an improvement as well, 38% of the bins put out for collection were uh, uh, half full or less. And finally, the fourth result in terms of contamination, we looked at two different types, uh, garbage within the, the bin and sorting errors, where people are putting glass metal plastic items that are not uh, containers or packaging, uh, such as toothbrushes, uh, hoses, and things like that that shouldn't be in a recycling bin. Uh, for the advised group, the overall contamination uh, decreased, and for the aware group, the overall contamination uh, increased. Uh, most notably, uh, the, uh, the targeted uh, message sent to the advised group uh, did have a measurable uh, impact on the um, uh, ensuring that only what should be in a recycling bin should be there. Uh, but we did note uh, a, an increase in sorting errors for both groups. Given a, a choice between do I put this in my garbage bin or in my blue bin, uh, if I'm not sure, I'm going to put it now in my blue bin, whereas in the past I was putting it in my, my garbage bin. So uh, I won't go into the details of the summary uh, of the the, uh, the 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 study's summary, but I've just gone through, uh, provided you that. But this did um, lead to uh, us uh, launching a um, a new tender for um, smart collection of our recycling, where the contractor's remuneration is also tied to the number of bins that they picked up. The difference for the residents. Um, they would not be charged based on their uh, bin presentation rate for the blue bin. But we do um, uh, recognize and ensure that the residents are aware that um, their efforts to put out their bin less frequently uh, do bring about um, savings, uh, both in terms of cost, but also in terms of production of greenhouse gas. 
implementation steps. Um, thankfully, with the support of the SEM through a pilot product, there's no commitment on, on the part of the city. Uh, we wait to see the results um, of the pilot. In both cases, uh, the pilot was conclusive, which allowed us to go move into the tender. It's important to include the results of the pilot product within the tender. From an execution standpoint, the campaign door-to-door -to, -door to inform our residents and uh, the fact that the residents had to pick the size of bin that they wanted uh, ensured that they were better informed about the uh, rationale and the justification for a so-called smart collection. And for the implementation of the smart collection, the various tools available to us allow us to uh, improve our, our, our service to our residents. It takes about three years to put that in place. So to summarize, uh, the environmental benefits, 51% uh, reduction per capita. Um, in terms of the amount of household garbage sent to landfill. Only four trucks are required now to pick up uh, the city on a given day versus eight. From an economic standpoint, uh, it cost us 42% less for our garbage uh, services. That additional savings allowed us to provide many more services um, to residents at the curbside, uh, such as bulky items that don't fit into the bin or green residue pickups. And residents uh, largely in 2016, three quarters paid less than they did in 2015, simply by putting out their bin less frequently. From a social standpoint, uh, the, the system allows for our residents uh, to decide their degree of participation in the program. And uh, it's a flexible solution that allows everyone to become agents of change. Thank you for your time. Throw less, it's smart. Uh, thank you so much, Andrew, for your presentation, uh, for sharing a bit more information about your city's smart collection system. And thank you as well to Michael. So together, this provides a great jumping off point to discuss municipal recycling, education opportunities in Canada. So we've now arrived at the question period. We have about um, 15 to 20 minutes remaining to tackle questions that were sent to us in the chat functions. I'd please like to remind uh, both of you, uh, Andrew and Michael, to answer briefly to allow for as many as possible. So we did get a lot of questions that were specific to both of your programs, uh, but we also had some really general uh, opinion-based questions as well. So I'm going to start off with um, one for, for you, Michael. So what people were wondering um, about the diversion opportunities. You mentioned that all residences, houses, and apartments um, have the same diversion opportunities. So do you see any difference between diversion rates in single family versus multifamily units? Yeah, it is. There's, there's a, I mean, there's a significant difference. And I think, I think other municipalities uh, will see, obviously, a, a similar difference between their diversion rates in curbside and in multi-res. Uh, I think the last numbers that I was looking at, we were around 42% um, for multi-res. And that was from our, our 2018 data. And, uh, and it's, you know, really, I think the biggest challenge in, in multi-res is, uh, is, you know, access and convenience to, to the waste system. Um, and the fact that there is a, there is a significant lack of accountability uh, in multi-res um, that we, we don't find uh, at, at curbside. We have the ability to track um, what a curbside home is setting out and, and their conformance. But in a bulk collection scenario like you, you get in multi-res, uh, you don't have that ability, so you can't give direct feedback to residents, you can't. Uh, I mean, in a lot of cases, you, you can't, you know, reject the collection because of contamination uh, or a misuse of, of what's being set out, uh, and that's that's one of the issues that we're, we're working on um, to try to infuse accountability into the multi-res setting. Um, and whether that takes, you know, punitive measures, maybe maybe there's a positive spin, maybe it's a you know a positive reinforcement uh, component that needs to be added in. We're still working on that. We've got some focus groups that we're planning. Uh, in, in later this year, and we're hoping that we can get some feedback um, from residents and from property managers and from condo boards to learn more about how we can, again, really elevate uh, the importance of recycling in multi-res to that same, like to the same standard that, you know, you can't put barbecues on your balconies and people, you know, people do a good, you can't go and park in somebody else's parking spot in a building. And, and we want to elevate the need to divert properly in buildings um, and try to get it on par with, with some of those other rules and regulations that are, are governed by, um, by boards and um, by condo rules. 
Thank you. Um, I'd be really curious to hear um, your answers to this next question. Based on your experience, um, both for you, Andrew, and Michael, what works better in your opinion, administration-led or council-led initiatives? So if, um, Andrew, you want to start us off, that would be great. Well, from a, uh, the beauty of a pilot project is um, there is no commitment. Um, uh, the administration uh, proposes a, a project that may come uh, in part from uh, support from council, but uh, mostly from observations from, from the administration. And um, as long as uh, the the, the council uh, sees the value and understands um, the the issues, um, and that there's no um, there's no um, commitment to go one way or another. Then um, the, the, there'll be support. Um, I guess the, the 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 simple answer to it is uh, they have to be supported by both the administration and council. Um, but uh, uh, initiatives that are initiated at the the administrative level tend to have more foundation in reality. I uh, I tend to think that getting I, I agree with what Andrew said completely. You need I think it's got to be both ways in a lot of uh, in a lot of different scenarios. I think though, but getting the, the political support. Um, for, for particular programs, uh, I guess at least in, in, in Markham's respect, has been integral uh, to ensuring that there's you know conformance and longevity uh, for some of our programs. Uh, and I and I, I speak maybe most specifically to Clear Bags, and that's something that um, there was a, a ton of opposition to. Uh, and but because there was such tremendous um, support from from our leaders and from council. Uh, the initiative was pushed through, and it's been sustained. We haven't we haven't reverted. Um, we've been able to, as uh, as a department, to be able to to enforce to the nth degree to ensure that we are getting a high degree of conformance. And we've been you know leaving leaving bags at the curb, and and people are are making the required changes um, based on the feedback that our contractor gives them. And I don't I don't think that happens if you have you know. Let's say a council that maybe that folds or, or or says you know we don't want to deal with the complaints that we're getting from our constituents. Um, there has to be a strong backbone to a lot of these programs, and I think that starts with with the political leadership. Uh, thank you both for sharing your thoughts. Um, a next question for Andrew: How did Beaconsfield uh, manage the adoption rate of the program? So things like incentives, enforcing a bylaw, did you allow for a grace period with your program? Could you expand a little bit on that, please? Uh, very good question. Uh, like I said, the pilot project really allowed us to, to test something that, uh, or form uh, that had been used elsewhere, but we allowed us to test it locally and then consult with the pilot participants and then hold open houses with our, our residents to, to see uh, w where we needed to refine both the message as well as the, the options and the choices. Um, uh, issues that, that were raised, uh, you know, uh, were included. Uh, uh, I'm not being uh, invoiced uh, to get uh, to begin with, so uh, this is just a tax grab because uh, you're not doing well. Um, it, it was an opportunity to to communicate to our residents uh, and so that they had a better understanding of of uh, where the city sat and what services were available to them. Um, to, to address uh, some of the, the irritants, um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the sessions uh, in open house um, provided an open forum and we made it clear that we hadn't made a, a decision about uh, where we were going, uh, but we needed your input uh, to decide whether this, uh, this made sense. Um, what did help us go, uh, uh, certainly was uh, we were one of the worst on the island and we had to, to, to do something about it. Doing nothing was not an option. Um, and the, uh, we really um, 
used our gra grassroots approach where local ambassadors uh, spoke to others. It wasn't just the administration sharing the information, but the people, the pilot project participants, our environmental committee uh, did uh, quite a bit of outreach to ensure that uh, people um, were aware of why the city was doing this. But ultimately, when it came to implement across the city, the door-to-door -door campaign was instrumental uh, to ensure that uh, people who had each individual different misconceptions or concerns, um, we could uh, provide that message face-to-face uh, -face and not simply through a, a, a flyer or a website. Thank you, Andrew, for, for that perspective. And just to expand on that, can I redirect um, this question to Michael about um, some of the common challenges your municipality faced, things like uh, pushback behavior against the program, and how did you overcome uh, some of these barriers that people uh, were experiencing? I, I, I think that you have to do your due diligence um, in the program implementation stage to make sure that uh, these initiatives uh, that are being launched are accessible uh, and tangible for residents and that you have a reasonable expectation um, of those who are going to be participating uh, in, in the program. And that's, that's something that I know Markham has always strived to do. And I mentioned previously just on, on the multi-res issue that we're planning on, on focus grouping um, the groups in in, uh, in buildings just to get a better sense of what we can do to improve uh, recycling in condos and apartments. And that that's the same, that's sort of the approach that Markham has always taken uh, when we're looking at, uh, when we're doing some preliminary research on a new initiative, whether it be, you know, clear bag or, or textiles, uh, is to hear directly from, from the people themselves, those that will be asked to conform to, you know, a new policy or participate in a, a new program. Um, so that we know that when we do actually end up implementing the, the program itself, that uh, that we've, we, I guess we've, we've made it reasonable. We've set the, the expectations and they're reasonable. And then I think once you're, you feel confident that that is the case, uh, then the, the enforcement component comes in. And this kind of just ties back into what we talked about previously and having um, strong political support. Uh, because there will be people, there will be laggards, people who take time or, or never do um, conform with, uh, with the program's expectation and, and they will put up a fight and a fuss and you have to hope that um, outside of just the department there is uh, there's support to, to push a program forward. Great, thank you so much. Um, just to change gears a little bit, we have a, a technological question for Andrew. What is your accuracy rate for the RFID tracking system reading set out rates? Uh, honestly, uh, because the uh, the remuneration of the uh, contractor is directly tied to the number of bin lifts, uh, they've done everything possible to ensure that the um, the the each collection is recorded by the system. Uh, thankfully, we, um, the platform uh, that's being used is. Uh, relatively straightforward and basic and uh, supported by a Quebec-based company. So if there's any issues, um, we can uh, intervene immediately. But the, the contractor is acutely aware that uh, uh, any, any missed collections uh, affects um, their, their remuneration. And so they have a numerous uh, uh, systems that they put in place both uh, at the start of the collection and during the collection to ensure that uh, each of the uh, the registered uh, bin list is recorded. Um, so I don't have a, a number for you to state, uh, you know, what is the, the percent inaccuracy, but it, it is very low because the uh, the uh, the people uh, driving the trucks are checking that the, uh, each bin lift is being recorded uh, as they go. Great, thank you so much for providing um, some of that information. So another question redirected for Michael, more about the relationship building. How much did the municipality of Markham have to consult with the with York Region to implement more targeted programming? Uh, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very much a two-way relationship, uh, regardless of, of what the program is because of our configuration as, as a two-tier municipal waste system. Um, so we will we will work with them. And I just, again, for example, just circling back to, to the multi-res, um, 
work that we're trying to do uh, in, in 19. Uh, we will work with them specifically to see if there are components that um, they can aid us with, whether it be uh, in auditing, um, in helping with some of the reporting that's done, uh, providing resources. Uh, so in a lot of, in a lot of ways, uh, many of the programs and initiatives that we plan on undertaking uh, are either are done in, in, in partnership with the region or at least in consultation with, with the region. And that's just because of the nature of, uh, of how our system works. Great, thank you. Um, so this is another question for both of you. Um, so we can start off with Andrew, if you can start off with that, sharing some of your thoughts. How does one raise recycling awareness in an environment where recycling can't be implemented because of geographical challenges? So I understand that this might not be the case for the two of you, but if you can provide some insight, that would be really appreciated. Uh, it might be difficult for me to answer directly. I can use uh, this comparison. Uh, the, if we didn't implement a organic uh, pickup. Uh, we had a choice between doing providing a brown bin or organic pickup or a so-called smart collection for, for garbage. And um, one of the rationales for that was uh, we have backyard properties where um, we can make use of that land uh, and, um, and treat the, 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 the product locally. Um, and so where recycling services um, aren't uh, available uh, due to geographic distance or things like that, um, uh, consolidating the, the, the collection points um, uh, and then, um, and then tr trucking it off uh, in, in more infrequent uh, uh, um, deliveries uh, may be uh, one option. But in terms of treating uh, the the recycled matter that is collected uh, locally that um, I can't speak directly to that. I, I'm sure Michael um, could help uh, on a uh, treatment side because that's not uh, a uh, function that Beacon feels directly responsible for. Uh, well, I mean, I guess not not so much on the on the, the treatment side because uh, Mark and we're, we're limited again just to the the collection of uh, of those streams specifically. I guess if, you, if you're talking, you know, from a, from a, a geographical context in terms of access to a program, uh, I guess it's sort of analogous to what we face um, in condos and apartments. Again, the the idea that uh, a lot of these a lot of these buildings were were designed, uh, they're older infrastructure, they're designed in a way that uh, it, re it requires residents to take you know elevators or or take the stairs down to a centralized recycling room because they were maybe retrofitted with um, space to to start recycling programs um, years and years and years ago, uh, and that's I, you know that that's an uphill battle for us uh, in in that uh, in that realm is that we're we're fighting the convenience of of people putting everything down their garbage chute because they simply have access on on the floor and maybe are you know just inherently too lazy to to walk down and divert material and and sorry that that that's, that kind of connects back to our goal of of trying to infuse the same level of accountability that we have um, at the curb uh, into into multi-res to let's say coerce people who maybe don't want to make that effort because of the you know maybe there, there is a challenge in terms of um, the distance they have to travel uh, to, to recycle effectively and, and that's that is something that we're evaluating more and more Thank you both for both commenting on this. I, I understand it was a little bit challenging given given your um, your guys' municipality. Um, one la I believe we have time for one last question if um, you answer a little bit briefly. Um, if you could both speak to how municipalities should position themselves to tackle the private industry single-use plastics problem, uh, that would be great. And we can start off with Andrew. Private industry. Uh... Uh, speaking uh, selfishly, or at least uh, as far as speaking is concerned, uh, the uh, the the uh, commercial establishments uh, do have access to our uh, recycling program, assuming that they uh, don't um, uh, have any needs greater than three big bins. Uh, for the one or two big uh, uh, grocery stores that have greater needs, uh, they're obliged to put in their own. Um, their own uh, services. Uh, 
the, the city of Beaconsfield, because of our, our low commercial um, ratio, um, we haven't done much outreach in terms of uh, encouraging uh, private uh, uh, commercial establishments uh, to, to do better. Um, that said, um, we, have, we do look to franchisees to see how we can partner with them to um, within their their buildings uh, along the lines of what Markham's done, uh, show by leading leading example both from the city but also uh, what can be done within the the places that our residents frequent. Um, I'll hand it, hand it over to Michael. Yeah, I, I think I think at a, at a sort of a broad level, establishing um, a clear direction uh, at on behalf of the municipality, uh, and I sort of touched on this in my presentation, but perhaps it's, you know, in creating a, a single-use plastics strategy um, is, is important. And wh whether, you know, that it, that includes um, some of the mechanisms that I think have been sort of talked about within the industry, like uh, by request bylaws or, you know, you know, maybe even going as far as, as potential bans somehow um, connecting back to uh, business licenses, you know, some of the tools that uh, that municipalities do have and, and to exert their, flex their muscle and respect to their interactions with the IC and I sector, um, that's important. And, and like like I mentioned before, we, we are actually, we're very willing, we'd love to hear more from, uh, from other, you know, municipalities, regional, provincial representatives uh, on what, maybe what the plan can be to establish uh, a strategy, again, that, that does share symmetries. I think one that does share symmetries with, uh, with municipalities and with, uh, with regions in a, in, a, in a geographic area, um, that would only strengthen uh, the ability to, to enforce um, something like, uh, you know, like a by request bylaw uh, or, or a ban to that effect. Okay, so we've run out of time. Michael and Andrew, thank you so much for taking the time to share your community's efforts with us. Both your knowledge and expertise have helped us understand the range of possibilities in raising recycling awareness through education initiatives all across the country. So thank you also to all the participants for your active engagement in the webinar and the question period, for bearing with us through all these technical challenges. The recording from today's webinar, including the audio and video, will be available within a few weeks on the FCM YouTube page. But before you go, we'd love to hear from you and have your feedback. So please take a really short moment to complete our participant feedback form after the webinar. It'll appear in a pop-up window. This is your chance to let us know what would help you to better manage your plastic waste and to integrate a circular economy approach. So please join us again next week on March 7th as we look at how St. John's has partnered with their sorting center. So thank you all and have a great afternoon.